I don't care what the overall chart looks like. I don't care about my opinion of the market. I just care about my money. You know, I'd heard about this crazy thing called Bitcoin. I want to defend my money. I want to be my money's best friend. Cryptos are the best charting market. I still think that there's a 50% chance it goes to 100,000 and a 50% chance it becomes worthless. What is up, everybody? I'm Scott Melker, AKA the Wolf of All Streets, a professional crypto trader and investor, and I'm talking to trading legends. I want to find out what makes them tick, how they keep their edge, and their secrets for maintaining decades of profitability. Now, we all know that 95% of all traders fail, so I'm doing a deep dive with those that sit comfortably in the top 5%, the gods. If you want to get a leg up in trading, then you've come to the right place. Welcome to my newest series, Trade Gods. Now, it's only right that in our inaugural edition of Trade Gods, we have on the legendary trader and investor, Peter Brandt. From mastering commodities to writing a bestseller, Peter has experienced every facet of being a trader and thought leader in this space. With a successful investing career spanning almost five decades, it's safe to say we can all learn a thing or two from him. Peter, thank you so much for coming on. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you. Yeah, you bet, Scott. Just keep in mind that you're supposed to be dead before you call the legend. So I, I, don't, I, I hope you're not being prophetic. I'm not being prophetic. I, I only speak out of reverence and not, uh, not, not with any prophecy. <laughs> so I want to dive right in because the point of this, obviously, is to understand what makes you tick as a trader, as I mentioned. So can you discuss your trading strategy, how you describe it, and what makes you unique as a trader? My, my trading style, I'm a swing trader. Uh, you know, and you've got to define what that means because it's going to mean something different for everybody. I mean, so for me, a losing trade is usually off in two days, three days, maybe one day. A winning trade might last anywhere from a week to two months, sometimes a little longer. And, uh, you know, so I'm trading futures, I'm trading Forex, I'm trading crypto, I'm trading some stocks. And, you know, normally I'm only looking for... Uh, you know, 20, 10 to 20 percent change in price every once in a while. I will take a trade on where I'm looking for something substantially more, you know, 50, sometimes even 100 percent change in price. Although that's really rare. And so I'm a chartist. I, I base my trading on the old classic uh, Richard W. Schaubacher, John McGee, Robert Edwards. Uh, I mean, it's head and shoulders rectangles, uh, diamonds, uh, channels, and that sort of thing. That pretty much defines me as a trader. I think what makes me unique is risk management, is the attention I pay to risk management in protecting my capital. Uh, I mean, that's the big emphasis that I have. I tell people charts don't really give you an edge. I mean, they give you, they give you a trade. They don't give you an edge. What gives you an edge is your ability to let a profit run and cut a, 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 a loss short, cut it quickly. Uh, I know people say that it's an overused saying, but boy, uh, where the rubber meets, meets the road, uh, that's where the payoff is. Alpha 5 is a new derivatives exchange with a twist. It's the first to deploy the same implied order book technology as you see on the CME, and it's now come to life with the backing of some of the most well-regarded investors in this space. What that means is that you can now, for the very first time in crypto, trade spreads or the price difference between two contracts across all products. You can trade your Bitcoin perpetual swap against the March future, the December future against the June. Whatever your view, no matter how funky your strategy, all the combinations are covered. And it's live now for both Bitcoin and Ethereum. And best of all, forget all the pockets of margin you have to remember. All trades on Alpha 5 are out of the same pot of equity and all unrealized profits are available for use immediately. If you are serious about exploring new strategies, love the idea of yield and looking to tap into ideas hidden in plain sight, be sure to check out Alpha 5. The link in the description below. Could you talk more in depth about your risk management strategy? Is it a matter of calculating, you know, risk versus reward? Is it uh, the way that you emotionally manage a trade? Do you step away permanently after you take a trade and just let it play out? Or do you actively manage it? What does your risk management strategy look like? Well, I, I mean, I'm a momentum. I enter on momentum. Uh, and so I'll look and see that we have a particular pattern in the market. 
and uh, I will wait for that pattern. I'll, I'll, I'll try to define that pattern. The clearer the pattern, the better. It's not a clear pattern. I'm not interested. And so I try to identify very precise patterns when uh, a pattern is completed, on the day it's completed, hopefully on the minute it's completed, I have an order in place to enter the trade. Uh, risk reward, a lot of people pay attention to it. Uh, you know, I'm only going to take a trade with a four to one risk reward. I, I don't pay any attention to that. Uh, if it's a good trade, if I, you know, for me, it's more important if I feel like I have a 50 50 chance over the next few days to move my stops to break even. That's really what I care about. Uh, whether a trade's going to go four times my risk or not, I don't risk a lot per trade. I risk, you know, maybe a one half of one percent of my trading capital per trade. Hmm. Uh, it used to be a lot higher when I was younger. Um, you know, even in recent years, it was up just under one percent of my capital. Uh, and so, if a trade works, uh, I look for a trade that's got to work right away. I mean, if a trade stalls out, starts going against me. Uh, I'm actively involved in, in trade management. I'll, I'll try to move stops sometimes by the end of day one. Uh, for sure, by the end of, uh, end of day one, end of day two, end of day three, I'm, I'm really uh, taking the attitude if this trade does not go, I'm blowing out. I, I don't care what the overall chart looks like. I don't care about my opinion of the market. I just care about my money. Uh, I, I, I want to defend my money. I want to be my money's best friend. And uh, then if a trade works, I try to divorce myself from it and give it an opportunity to work. Um, and so uh, I really only change my orders uh, end of day. And uh, so I try to stay away from markets during the day because I know that if I start watching markets during the day, I'm my own worst enemy and I'll find a way uh, to sabotage myself. You just touched on the most important aspect, I think, which is the uh, over-analysis paralysis or reacting to fear and greed based on what you may or might, may not be seeing in the chart. I, I find the exact same thing in that uh, my trades perform far better when I step away and uh, pretend that they don't exist. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting to hear that even after trading for so long, that you still recognize that in yourself and that you don't want to make an impulsive decision based on, on what you're seeing in the charts. So I'm curious, that touches obviously on the part of your risk management strategy where it's clear that you defend your capital before you are concerned with growing it, right? So you're moving your stop into profit, you're making sure that it doesn't become a loser or that a winner doesn't become a loser. I'm curious as to overall portfolio management, if you're risking under 1% of a trade, what percentage of your total uh, portfolio are you actually actively willing to trade with? Well, keep in mind, I'm a leveraged market trader. I, I trade, uh, for the most part, markets on, uh, in futures, generally speaking. You're really only putting a few percent of the underlying value of a contract you're trading up for margin. And so uh, in futures and Forex, it's rare that I have more than 15% of my money committed, which means I have 85% of my money sitting uh, sitting on the sidelines. When I get a little bit more heavy in stock, obviously, you know, it's only a 50% margin, but I, it's rare that I have uh, my whole stack all in. That, that, that for me just almost never happens. And so generally speaking, um, the capital that I use to carry a trade or, you know, the margin requirement seldom extend, extends beyond 10%. But now the value of the underlying contracts that I'm carrying, for instance, gold, uh, contract to gold is, you know, worth $180,000. You know, sometimes if I add up the underlying value of the positions I have on, that might go to 2x, 3x. Uh, but normally is somewhere in the area of 1.5x. Understood. So uh, I'm curious. Can you describe to me your average day, your process, how you approach your entire life as a trader, not even specifically what you're doing when you're actively trading? Uh, I mean, I, I don't really even see myself as a trader, Scott. Uh, I mean, people have this vision of traders that go in a room and there's a wall full of screens and people are yelling and shouting and getting excited. I, I, I want to keep 
my trading operation about as exciting as an undertaker. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you know, I don't want emotional swings. I don't want to get excited about winners. I don't want to get down about losers. I try to stay in a very, very uh, neutral uh, mental state. But I enter all my orders uh, usually about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. That's Arizona time. After the markets close, I look at the positions I have on. I look at the trades I might want to enter. And at any given time, trades that I might want to enter or that I have orders in to enter, it might be two or three, maybe four trades at the most. Trades that I carry in at the end of each day might be anywhere from four to six or seven trades. And so I kind of line up at the end of the day and determine where I want my order. I'm an order placer. I'm a glorified order placer. And so I want to enter orders that make sense based on the chart that I'm looking at. Uh, that I can say a year from now, I can look at that chart and I could look at an order I might have executed and I might be able to say, you know, that, that made sense. That trade made sense based on how I look at markets. Uh, it, you know, for me, it's real troubling if I have to look back at a trade and go, you yeah, know, I wonder why I did that one. And so then I revise my trades, my orders a little bit in the morning when I get up, which is usually four o'clock my time, wherever I am. You know, I always look at markets and you think, well, are there a couple orders maybe I want to tweak based on what happened overnight? And so that's really my day. Other than that, I try to get away from the markets. I try to turn off screens. Um, I may look at screens, but I turn off my API to my orders. And so uh, I want to I want to cut the ties to my ability to place an order. Uh, but I may look at charts, but I'm not looking at hourly charts or five minute charts or anything like that. I'm just curious about maybe looking at some markets I haven't looked at. Maybe I want to come in and look at iron ore in China or take a look at what happened to silver in 1971 and what, what might that look like relative to the day. So I'm doing that kind of stuff uh, during the day. So I really don't do much. My orders may be executed during during the active trading hours, but I really don't want to be actively placing orders. I don't want to be trading during that time. I'll let the orders trade, but I don't want to be the one to do the trading. My next question actually is somewhat personal. My grandfather was a stockbroker, and at uh, breakfast every morning, he would uh, take out his paper, pencil, ruler, and start you know manually drawing charts, and that's what he would do every single morning. What were your first charting experiences like, and how has the evolution of technology changed your trading? Oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty crazy stuff. Uh, and I relate to grandfather because I kept paper charts by hand. You know, people today just assume you can go on all kinds of different sites. You can go into trading platforms, trading view, uh, and you've got all of these computers computer charting platforms and you can do indicators and you can draw lines and you can do all that stuff. We didn't have that. Uh, and so I would either, uh, I bought graph paper. I bought graph paper by the inches high and well, we'd do charts by hand with a ruler. I'd use an, uh, a, a number two fine point Bic black pen. It had to be a number two Bic. Uh, I mean, that's what I drew them with. And, uh, you know, there were some printed chart services. Commodity Research Bureau had printed chart services. Uh, but I didn't want to get that because then I'm starting each week with new charts. And I love the fact that I, 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 I had this memory in the connection to a market through the fact that I drew the charts and kept them up and didn't rely on what somebody else was printing. Uh, I, I would buy those charts once a month, and then sometimes I, I, I transitioned over to keeping their charts up, uh, oftentimes, and not doing my own charts. But yet, on a day-to-day -day basis, even when I purchased their charts, I would try to go a month where I was the one that was marking in the lines. So cool. It's so cool. I think it's a, probably a valuable experience for being able to you know manage all the all the insane amount of information that now is available to be able to slow down and, and look at it probably in that manner. So um, I read that you, I believe it was in 90, 1995, you burned out. 
that you quit trading for an extended period of time. Can you can you talk about that phase in your life and, and how you overcame it and came back? Yeah, I mean, I, I thought I was going to quit for maybe two, three years and I needed a break. I, I mean, I had at that point traded 20 years. That's, I think, you know, that's that's a lifetime. Uh, you know, and I always, even today, say that if trading stops become mean fun for me, why would I trade? And it was a stage in my life where trading just kind of stopped becoming fun for me. And I felt like I couldn't go halfway. Either I had to be trading or, or I had to just not be trading. So I shut things down. I didn't have any uh, quote services coming in. I didn't know where prices were. And I became involved in a bunch of other things. I actually became an NGO at the United Nations and got very, very involved with things that were going on uh, with the Economic and Social Council at the United Nations, attending meetings all over the world and meeting with other NGOs. And uh, I, I thought I'd do that for three or four years, but after 10 years, I started getting the itch and I thought, you know, I, I really want to trade again. I'm the pay and so that's where I am, and now I'm on year, year 13 of my, 14 of my return to trading. So maybe in six years, I'll either croak as an old man, or I'll once again uh, have trading stop becoming fun for me, and I'll hang it up. That was a long break. Yeah, yeah, very long break. And markets had changed, too, because when I left, we did not have electronic markets. It wasn't such a thing as... Uh, entering orders on the computer. They were all called in. I'd call all my orders in. I'd, do, uh, I'd, do, uh, uh, I'd write out paper tickets and time stamp them. Uh, time stamp the order when I entered it. Time stamped it once it was, I got confirmation. Time stamp it when it was filled. Uh, you know, and then all of a sudden I'm looking at a market that's uh, traded around the clock. Uh, although Forex was traded around the clock back in the 80s and 90s. Um, and uh, traded by computer, and uh, the, the exchanges were moving to computerized exchanges. Uh, Globex was in existence, and so I came back to a very different world, and it took me a little while to get in step with that. I'm sure. So it's interesting. I've always viewed trading as a largely individual pursuit. We, we probably don't know who the most successful traders of all time are, right? They're anonymous, they're out there, and they're doing exceptionally well. But there's a bipolarity because you became famous, right? It's a very individual pursuit, but you managed to become a very famous trader. How, how did that happen? Well, I mean, it wasn't by intent. Uh, it, you know, I, I, I wrote a book about my trading back in the early 90s. Uh, we only printed a thousand copies. We printed a thousand. That was it. Uh, and it wasn't a really high production, you know, a lot of the pages were photocopies. My goodness, you know, it was hardbound. It, it's available, uh, it, it is available on the internet. It's, it's way too, I think it goes for four or five hundred bucks, way too expensive. Uh, <laughs> because there were only a thousand produced, and, but then in, 2011, I did another book. A publisher had been bugging me if I ever wanted to do another book, I'd do another book. So uh, I did one grudgingly. It actually was the number one financial book on Amazon for like 25 weeks, which just shocked me. I'm kind of going, who are these people that even want to read what I wrote? My <laughs> goodness, this is crazy. Somebody wants to buy a book about graphs. And then the publisher put me on Twitter, figuring you know, the book would benefit from any exposure I had on Twitter. And so I hopped on Twitter, which was a whole world I wasn't ready to enter and still is a crazy world. And, and I was real lucky because I really made some bold calls back then. And one was a top in silver. And uh, silver had a run up that topped at around 49, 50 bucks. And I tweeted about it day after day because I felt this is the top. We are topping in silver. There's that major top. And I picked up a lot of Twitter following this on that. And then I picked up a whole bunch of uh, cryptomaniacs. You know, back in 2017, I started picking up a lot of cryptomaniacs. And I guess those were the two big factors that 
you know, that made me a household name, and I'm not really a household name, but uh, that got my I think you are. So then that's an interesting segue. How did you get into the crypto space? How did you first hear about Bitcoin, and when did you start trading it? You know, I'd heard about this crazy thing called Bitcoin. I mean, you know, it was out there floating around. I'd see stuff on Twitter about Bitcoin, read some things. I'm going, I have computer money. Why do we need computer money? I didn't know it. I didn't even know what it was. And a friend of mine, Raul Paul, who heads up Real Vision, which is a trading operation, research operation down in Cayman Islands, he sent me a chart in uh, 2015. I can't remember what the day was, 2015 of Bitcoin, and uh, said, Peter, what do you think of this chart? And I looked at the chart and I went, oh my goodness, this is just, this is crazy good. And which is, to me is an irony because people always say, oh, cryptos, you're a chartist. Cryptos don't chart. Well, let me tell you, cryptos are the best charting market. Uh, Ever. <laughs> yeah, nothing charts like cryptos. and But I looked at the chart and it just appealed to me. I didn't even know. I had to do some research to find out even how to open an account. Raul referred to me to the firm he was trading with. I opened an account, sent him some money. I didn't know even how to buy. And so first uh, Bitcoins I bought were, you know, down down in the, I think in the high 400s. And that was wow. my first entrance into Bitcoin. And, um, you know, Raul also had, a, uh, he had a lot bigger position than I had on. And, uh, you know, Bitcoin crawled up and got to a thousand. And I got out and thought it was a genius. Uh, I got out of half and thought, my goodness, you know, because for me, doubling up price of anything wow that's i'll take that any day but then i got a lot of criticism on twitter oh what a fool you got a bitcoin at a thousand what a fool you are and i'm thinking who are these people they don't understand what i'm doing uh i got out of the rest around 2500 but then bought half back again at about the same price and wrote it up into the 19s and the, the top was Ooh. so clear uh, the top was screaming. It was just like the silver top. It reminded me so much of the silver top. The 2017 top in Bitcoin was a carbon copy of silver's 2011 top. Uh, it shared everything in common. It was an easy top to call. Uh, and so the, that I, I, I rode most of that. I, I, I held, it was almost one where you couldn't avoid hold, riding most of it. All I had to do was hold it one more night. One more night, one more night, you know, things going up at the end, a thousand dollars a day. It was just absolutely crazy. But um, yeah, that that was qu quite an exciting move. I still don't understand cryptology. I mean, if you ask me, bit, you know, all of these different numbers and the lexicon they use to to, to uh, describe crypto, I am I, I'm clueless. I want to drill into something you just said, because I think it's really interesting and valuable. You were able to identify both of those tops. Now, I know that you're not a trader who generally targets tops and bottoms. You trade momentum and within the movement. But you said that both of them were screaming tops. So I want to understand for other people as well, how do you know when it's that clear of a top? What signals were you seeing and, and how is that so clear? Well, I mean, there's a couple ways. It's sentiment largely, right? I, I mean, you, you look at volume, you start getting real spiky volume. You start accelerating at a rate that is just not sustainable. Uh, but for me, you know, everybody I've kind of uh, met in life, all my friends know I'm a trader. And so there's kind of different levels when somebody calls me and I start getting lots of calls. At first, people going, Peter, what do you know about Bitcoin? What's your opinion about Bitcoin? Should I buy Bitcoin? How do I buy Bitcoin? And people start asking me about that. But then when you start getting calls from friends who are bragging to you that they actually own Bitcoin, that didn't know what Bitcoins were a month prior, you start going, whoa, this is not, 
um, this is not a stable market. I, I mean, it's the old saying when your barber in your taxi cab, your Uber driver starts bragging to you about how much money they're making in whatever market it is, you, you're, you, you may not be at the top, but you're really close. You're in the month of the top or in the week of the top. In the case of Bitcoin, it was within hours of the top. You could kind of tell uh, that this is getting frothy and can't sustain itself. Was that uh, trading from 2,500 to the top of Bitcoin your best trade ever? And if not, what was? Uh, no, it actually wasn't my best trade ever, yeah, mainly because I never really had on the size that I would want to have had on or that I would have on or that I have on now because I understand the market. I mean, back then it was still, you know, a strange market to me. I, 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 I've had a lot of really, really good trades. And for me, a really good trade is one in which probably I have a 20 to 50 percent ROR on my capital in just that one trade. Uh, or, or there's been a couple of trades where I doubled my capital in one trade. Uh, and I was long the U.S. stock market back in, you know, and people are going to look at these years and not relate to them because, you know, really people traded back then. But 1987, I just loaded the boat with, uh, at the time, it wasn't S&Ps. We didn't, we traded S&Ps. But the active trade was a New York Composite Index futures, and I was I had loaded the boat in January of two thousand of nineteen eighty seven, and and that was a really good trade. Uh, I've made substantial money in the gold market in uh, two thousand nine, two thousand ten. There was a big run up in gold; it doubled in price. You know, went from it gradually moved up. And then it had the final leg was, you know, 800 to 1800. And then, you know, here recently uh, in gold, we had we had a big move in gold that we're still in. Actually, we're still in that move of gold and started in the summer of 2019 and we're still in it. It's not done. I am no longer in a position, but, you know, uh, the, the first 300 bucks of the move not only were easy, but there were the kind of moves where it was possible to have a big position out of the starting gate. So sometimes for me, my big trades aren't necessarily the huge moves, but they're moves that take place in such a way that I'm able to take a larger than normal position from the start. And so I, you know, come out of the starting gate with a big, with, with a nice trade. And I know how much money I've made as a trader over my lifetime, my career earnings. I can calculate my career earnings. I, I know it because it's on my tax forms. Uh, but then I go back and say that represents X number of trades. Now, what percentage of those trades actually represent the total bottom line? Uh, what proportion of trades really made me my money? Uh, and that's only 10%, maybe, you know, 10% of all my trades, uh, you know, so it's kind of the old Pareto principle of 80, 20, 20, 80. But, you know, for me, it's kind of 10, 90, you know, 10% of my trades make 90% of my money. The other 90% of the trades, my job is just to kind of keep myself from bleeding to death. Uh, keep the damage down, you know, uh, you put on band-aids and tourniquets. Uh, and then let that 10%, hopefully I can be lucky enough to find the 10% and then keep myself out of screwing those up and letting those trades actually work. Uh, so I, I think that that pretty much explains it. Is is The really good trades are the ones that they work right away and you just happen to be lucky enough to keep yourself from screwing them up. So we all remember our best trades and obviously uh, revel in the profits of those. But the biggest lessons, in my opinion, come from our worst trades. Can you talk about your, your worst trades? Yeah, my, you know, I've had a lot of stinkers. Um, you know, I've had a lot of bad trades that, you know, uh, for me, again, I, I try I try to keep a trade from losing any more than, 
you know, a half of 1% of my capital. It used to be higher. In the early days, I'd risk 2 to 5% of my capital. And so, you know, there were trades in which I lost 2 to 5% of my, my money. But I had a big position on in crude oil. Uh, back in 1991, and and uh, you know I'm I'm at home, and the turn on the news, and the U.S. is bombing Baghdad, uh, yeah. and I had a really big long position on in crude oil, which I probably shouldn't have had on because we had a war on, and I normally don't like risking a position in news that's going on. I I don't like that. Uh, and but I had a big position on, and I called London, and crude oil was actually up. It was up substantially. It was up like uh, maybe four or five dollars on what we call the curb. That was the old illegal version of the twenty-four hour market, the overnight market. Uh, it was higher, and I figured, oh boy, this is going to be great. I'm going to have fun tomorrow uh, because I have this position on crude's up you know, three bucks in London. I figure I'll come in here. It'll be up two, three bucks, and it's going to be a great day. And it was kind of, it ended up being buy the rumor of war, sell the fact, because I came in the morning and crude oil was called 700 lower, $7 lower. Um, and it opened lower than that. And so, you know, I took about a $7,500 overnight loss per contract in crude oil, and I had a big position on. And, uh, you know, I'd never risk crude oil, $7,000 a contract in crude oil. And so I had an overnight hit of 7000 Actually, it was bigger than that because the night before it was trading higher. So from when I went to bed to where it opened up, it was like a $9 a barrel drop in crude oil prices. And I don't second guess those. If I get hit like that, I'm not going to go. I'm going to hold my position to see if it if it gets a little less bad. I When I have a deal like that, I just go, I want out. I don't care. I just want out. I'll take my loss. Uh, I, I'm not going to wait for it to improve. And so I took my loss actually right after the market opened and took my pain and walked away. Do you remember how much the total loss was? Oh yeah, I mean it was uh, it, it was in the six figures. Big loss. Yeah. So what's interesting? So you answered one of the questions I was going to ask, which is that you cut it immediately, which I think shows tremendous uh, tremendous discipline because a lot of people would obviously wait and see if they can get a bounce or a better exit, which by the way they never end up taking when it arrives. But yeah, does yeah, that mean true, you did true. not have? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, it'll go a little high, right? Yeah, yeah, um, uh, exactly. Have a, I have a son that's so, involved in a trade like that right now. Keep telling me he's a fool. So, yeah. So, did you have a stop loss in place, or was it just that it you know gapped so hard uh, overnight that it was irrelevant? How, how did how did you end up in that position where you were well beyond your uh, managed risk? Well, it opened there. I, I mean, it's not like it opened and changed and started trading low. It just opened. I mean, keep in mind, we didn't have overnight markets back then. Uh, right. I mean, you know, we, we'd close at 3 in the afternoon New York time and open at 7 a.m. You know, that's why people freak out about overnight gaps. You know, I just see a whole generation of people that are freaked out and worried about overnight gaps. I mean, that's the world I lived in. I lived in that world for for decades, you know, markets didn't trade overnight. Um, we gapped all the time. Um, I never really worried that much about overnight gaps, but in this case, of course, uh, I, I did have a stop in that was uh, an open stop. I, I can't cancel my open stop and just did it at the market. I'm curious, emotionally as a trader, when you have a loss like that and then you decide to take the loss, what does it feel like when you then see the asset rise and, uh, you know, realize that your realized loss could have been smaller. Well, I mean, that's always the case, right? You know, you always run the risk. You know, people are worried about, well, I'll put a stop in and I'll get stopped out at the low and then the market will turn around and go in my favor. That That's one of those where, you know, hey, trading is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Uh you need to be focused more on process of doing things in a smart way, not worry about the money you're going to make. You know, worry about the process. 
uh, about how you do things day in and day out. But and so, yeah, I mean, that's part of life. Uh, that's part of training. Uh, I, I mean, it, it, uh, it doesn't feel good. It never feels good. I, I mean, hey, I, I've, this is the sixth different decade in which I've traded markets. Um, and getting stopped out and have a market to turn around, that is part of the process and you have to learn to live with it and never feels good. It always feels ugly. Uh, but it happens and uh, you, you just have to walk away from it and say, well, you know, such is life. And, you know, I, there's no easy answer. Everybody has to learn to handle those differently. But you got to just learn think, to wash your hands yeah. from a market and say, OK, it's on to the next one. It's really the hardest skill. I think that most people end up revenge trading those situations and yeah. <laughs> buying the top and see it go back the other way and getting chopped up, right? Yeah, and, and let me let me just to mention, Scott, my attitude is I'll try an idea twice. And if I'm wrong, I'm not going to keep bleeding on the same hill. You know, I'll fight on a hill two times. And if, if I lose on the hill two times, okay, that's that's it for me. Uh, I'll go on to a different trade. I just, I, I'll delete that symbol from my quote machine. I don't want to pay attention to it. I don't even want to look at it for a while. Because I think sometimes people become compulsive. They lose money in market XYZ, and they feel they need to make their money back in market XYZ. Well, why? Uh, the, the next good trade might be in market ABC. Uh, don't worry about XYZ. You know, go on with your life. Uh, and so I know that happened to me in Bitcoin. I, I was short Bitcoin, you know, in September 2019. I thought Bitcoin had topped. I thought we were going to go lower. I got short Bitcoin futures. One of the few times I've traded Bitcoin futures, by the way. I don't like shorting cryptos. Uh, and I had a good trade going for about four or five weeks, and then it rallied and stopped me out, and it stopped me out just about at the high, and then proceeded to drop five, six thousand dollars a coin, which I had to watch. And, you know, that happens. It's interesting, though, what I found trading other markets is that the emotional attachment to assets is not as dramatic. I think for crypto traders, they fall in love with these assets, especially well, Bitcoin itself and other altcoins. And then they do revenge trade or get emotionally attached to that specific asset as opposed to going to another market. I just don't think people have like the same passion for the yen or, or for a certain stock, right? Silver. So it, it really lends into this emotional trading. Yeah, silver, the silver bulls are kind of similar to the crypto bulls. Yeah, what about the, uh, what about the Peter Schiff's of the world? Oh, I mean, they're lunatics. Uh, I mean, <laughs> you shouldn't even follow them. Uh, yeah, the Peter Schiff's of the world, uh, they exist in just about every market. I mean, they have no credibility. They never change their mind. Um, eventually, they're right. You know, so they're wrong for, for 19 years. And then they pound their chest and say, look how smart I am. I, I mean, even if you go back and annualize the return of gold over the years, it's a lousy asset. Um, I mean, gold is not anything to brag about. It's a great store of value. And so if you own gold as a store of value and you own it not when it's been spiking for six months, uh, gold is a, is a wise store of value. Is it a good trade? No, not really. Is it a good investment? No, not really. One's better off in high quality stocks. You know, if you're going to commit yourself for a lifetime, gold's not the thing to do. Bitcoin, maybe a little bit. But primarily stocks that earn money, companies that earn money. Uh, I mean, if you even look at the stock market going back, uh, whatever, 100 years, the increase in the value of the stock market is due primarily to earnings in the devaluation of the dollar. Uh, and so that's, yeah, the Peter Schiff's of the world have no credibility. I really don't ever care what, what they say or what they say about me. If... A millennial had $100,000 to, to invest or trade right now. How much of it do you think that they could reasonably put in Bitcoin? 
Well, um, yeah, younger people would probably say, you know, the, all of it. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I would say to somebody, they're coming out of school, they have a good, they, they can get a good job, they have good earning power as an engineer or whatever the case may be, medical services, a business, but they, they feel secure about the earning potential for their life. And, and unfortunately, to a lot of college students, that's not reality. That's and that's sad to me. Um, yeah. But I would say, first off, you need to support your family. You need to support your lifestyle. You need to try to find a home. You need to get into a home. And then, if you have investment money uh, to do, I would say uh, do a twenty percent in Bitcoin. Only Bitcoin. None of this other, uh, uh, no crap coins. No, no, no. no hey, a lot of these coins are like, they're beanie baby pet rocks. Uh, yeah. You know, 98% of coins are going to end up worthless. Uh, but put 20%, 25% into Bitcoin, do it every month, and do 75% into high quality stocks. Or, you know, maybe you take a little bit out to do gold as a store of value. But you want to get it out of dollars. You do not want to ha accumulate a large sum of U.S. dollars or any fiat. You, you just want to keep, get your money out of fiat. Um, and I think, you know, if someone's looking to that, you know, over the course of a lifetime into their 50s, they're going to be in very, very good shape. Uh, even if we have to go through some bad recessions along the way, that, that they want that. I mean, I, that's what I tell my kids. Buy stocks and hope they go down. Buy good companies and hope you can buy them cheaper and not worry about it. You know, buy companies like Apple Computer, Walmart, Domino's Pizza, uh, Honda, uh, you know, German companies. Buy them and, and hope that they go down 50%. Because you can dollar cost average your whole life, and you'll do very well doing that. I That's wish such, I would have done such, that. Such good, yeah, <laughs> such good. That, yeah, I mean, I I didn't start early enough, but that's always been my strategy. I mean, I started dollar cost averaging into SPY in like two thousand six, and I was underwater for most of my life, and now every single trade is in profit, right? Every single buy is basically in profit over the last year. So yeah, you have a lot yeah. of time and, and I think plays out. SPY is a, is a good, that's a good investment. You don't have to figure out what stocks to buy. Just buy SPY. Yeah. So interesting because I, I believe I read before that you had said 10% uh, was a good amount um, for, you know, a millennial perhaps putting Bitcoin. Now the number is 20, 25%. Echoes my own sentiment, by the way. I used to say 5%, it became 10, and now I'm pretty much say, uh, have at it. You know, uh, I believe in it. W why has uh, that bias or that number changed for you? Well, see, I always felt like, even when I started understanding uh, a Bitcoin, and for me, Bitcoin is crypto, crypto is Bitcoin. Uh, they're one and the same. Uh, maybe Ether, uh, Ethereum uh, is, you know, a close cousin. But um, I always felt like there was a 50% chance that Bitcoin could go to whatever, name your price, you know, um, 50,000, 100,000, whatever the price is. And a 50% chance it would become worthless. That, you know, we'd look back 20 years from now and go, that was an interesting experience, experiment, but something new technology, technology always changes, something brand new happens. And it becomes outdated. Um, and, you know, for me, I always looked at Bitcoin. It could be a store of value. It could be a medium of exchange. It, it could become uh, it could become a currency. It could take on currency characteristics. And uh, I think what's happening is we're seeing some of those take place. We're seeing some corporations that not only sell their shoes online for Bitcoin, but also store Bitcoin in their corporate treasury. Um, they've adopted Bitcoin. They're adopting Bitcoin. I always felt like when you can start looking at Fortune 500 annual reports and there's a line item in their annual report 
uh, where they're storing assets in bitcoins rather than in um, interest-bearing treasury bonds, that there's actually storing some of their, their, their assets in bitcoin, that that's when we can say, hey, we're really starting to see acceptance and it really can be now a medium of exchange, a currency and a, and a store of value. And we're starting to see that. I mean, that's why Paul Tudor Jones um, moved into, in, in, into crypto. I think it was 5% was the figure he had, which, by the way, was what I did. I wish it would have been 10 but uh, and so, but that's always true. You never, never own enough of the good trades. You always own too much of the garbage. So I, I think that's what's Such. changed. Is we're just starting to uh, Bitcoin is starting to realize it's the narrative that I'd had for years. So as I touched on in the intro, ninety-five percent of traders completely fail. Right? They bust out, and they generally do it quickly. So if someone becomes a successful professional traders, so to speak, what kind of percentage profits do you think that they can expect or hope to make on a year yearly basis? And what, what has been your average since you know every trade or over each year of your career? Well, um, there's a lot of ways to calculate it for one thing. You know, you're taking money out, you're putting money in. Uh, there, there's just a lot of ways. So I, I'm never really very trustful of, of, of right. a percent because it, you know, as a professional trader, it's hard. It's not like you start an account and the, the account grows and you never take money out and you can do a compounded right. rate of return. It doesn't work that way. Um, I always thought it was, for me, it was 40. I, I, did, I had an audit. Uh, the auditors came in and looked at my stuff back in 2012, I think, and they had come up with 41.5%. But uh, Jack wow. Schwager, the writer of Market Wizards, ran my numbers and he had a higher number he had in the 50s i'd rather use the lower number but i don't think traders can think <laughs> that way you can't think i'm going to make a thousand dollars a week to four thousand a month hey this is trading it does it's not an annuity uh it doesn't work that way i mean i've had losing years uh, i'm right now i'm in a six month drawdown not a big drawdown like two percent uh, but I, I've been treading water. And, you know, my experience is when people quit their day jobs and become a trader, almost invariably the first year is a losing year. I, I mean, that's just the reality. That's how it works. I don't know why, but it's how it works. For me. Yeah, and so I don't think you can think that way. Um, you, you, you know, money comes in fits and starts, and the Pareto principle applies. You know, 10% of your trades produce 90% of your profits. 10% of your years produce 90% of your profits. 10% of your weeks produce 90% of your profit. 10% of your months produce 90% of your profits, whether 10, 90, 20, 80, whatever it is. But it, it, and so you can't, you can't do that. You can't create a budget as a trader. That's the big joke among traders, by the way, is how do you explain to your wife she can't ever have a budget? Um, <laughs> you know, you tell that to professional traders, and they'll laugh right away because they know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, of course. That, that, that's just the way it works. So I, I think people who go, well, if I can make 300 a day and, yes, you know, welcome to life, you'll find out that doesn't work. Well, the market loves to punish good be behavior and uh, and reward bad behavior, right? So I, I've always argued that the worst thing that can happen to a trader is to do really, really well at the beginning. Oh, that that's always been said. I mean, I've heard that I've heard that since 1974. That the worst thing that can happen to a trader is he hits a hot streak right at the front end. That you're far better off struggling for a while, but at least making it through. And surviving it. Those traders are going to do better over the long term than the trader that comes out with a hot hand the first few trades or the first few months. Those guys are destined to be wiped out. Yeah, and they buy the Lambo before they get uh, wiped out, right? So uh, yeah, they, they, well, they scale up their lifestyle. Yeah, and that's another thing is I, I'm not a Lambo guy. I mean, I don't... I've always been very, very suspect of guys that show their office with a wall full of screens and 
you know, big fancy cars. I mean, I, I, I bought, I bought a used pickup truck, uh, two years ago and it replaced a pickup truck that was 20 years old and had rust. Um, you know, I, I don't want to show off stuff. I mean, you know, this whole idea about buying Lambos, I, I think traders that are obsessed with buying Lambos are going to end up in the junk heap of history, quite frankly. You know, show me a I trader agree. who's going to earn some money, squirrel it away and buy a used Toyota and not have a wall full of screens, but have two or three modest screens. That's all you need. I've got two modest screens there in the background. You can see that that's all I've got. And frankly, I uh, upgraded from one after a while just because uh, yeah. Twitter and email were bothering me too much on my main screen, not because I needed more yeah, for, I got uh, that for charts. Yeah, I, I, I understand <laughs> that. So I, I'm curious, um, what do you think of Bitcoin now? Obviously, we've seen this uh, tremendous rise from the March lows when quote unquote crypto was once again dead. And here we are, you know, sitting above 15,000. Um, and, you know, that may be different when obviously this comes out. But uh, do you think this thing is just getting started? Do you see any top signals? Where do you think we are potentially going? Oh, I mean, I'm fully long. I mean, I in uh, 2000. Uh, 18, I set aside a sum of money that I said, this is Bitcoin money. Um, that's fully employed. Um, it hasn't been fully employed since then. I mean, I, mean, I, I scale in, I scale out, but uh, I'm, I'm fully committed. There's no sign for me that, that Bitcoin won't keep going up. I mean, I, I think Bitcoin is a marvelous marvelous thing and i still think that there's a 50 percent chance it goes to 100,000, and a 50 percent chance it becomes worthless so <laughs> you know, that's still my narrative well if it, if it if it goes to zero there's going to be a lot of very wealthy people that go there with us this time as opposed to just our taxi drivers and, and barbers yeah 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 <laughs> very true um I, i'm curious you know, you could have done anything with your life. You chose to be a trader. What What's your life goal as a trader? What What's the end game? What are you What, what were you looking to accomplish? Well, I was looking to accomplish. Basically, I thought it would be a great. You know, I didn't have to sit in meetings. I didn't have to write memos. I could know. Uh, I had a du direct feedback loop on how I was doing. Um, you know, I just had to survive the first few years and try to build up an account. And I tried it. And I think I was, I was lucky enough. I had great mentors. Um, you know, I was one of the few. I pinch myself sometimes and go, seriously? Really? I've been able to support my life, put away money for my retirement, help my kids by trading markets? I mean, do people do that? Uh, Not and, many. Yeah, and so, yeah, it's almost surreal. Um, but I just kind of, now, as long as it's fun, I'd rather do this than garden or play golf or collect stamps. Um, you know, it's still fun to me. So what a fun retirement job. I don't trade the size I used to trade. Um, I trade in some ways a little different, but, you know, I, I, I can see... The day when I don't hardly trade at all, uh, you know, I just kind of want to make it through, humble, you know, limp through life and make it to the end now. Um, I'm not there, but I can kind of see it. I'm on the hill <laughs> looking down. But, uh, you know, so I've accomplished what I wanted to, and I've really now devoted the period in the last decade really to teaching, uh, to sharing, uh, to guiding guys at the board of trade that poured themselves into me early on and I, I I think I survived and made it because of their help and so to some degree I I want to try to do that um you know I've used charts and in, in very very specific ways to make a living why wouldn't I want to trade change why wouldn't I want to uh, share that with people you know, and maybe I, I share it with 100 people and three or four of them latch onto it and go, yeah, you know, Jack Schwager just came out with a new Market Wizards book. 
Uh, great. Anyone who has any interest in trading needs to read all of the Mark Wizards books. I mean, they're brilliant. Um, hey, there were three people, uh, two others, in this new Market Wizards book that I think that attribute the fact that they made it there to my ability to share some of the things I knew. So, you know, that's what I want to do. If Jack ever wants to write another book, it'd be great if, you know, 20% of the people featured were people that had something to do with me. Maybe 20% of the people will have nothing good to say about me, too. I mean, so... Welcome hey, to life. <laughs> that, 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 that's life. Yep, yep. Wow, what an incredible, uh, what an incredible legacy to, to leave. So I have to ask then, what is at the core of what you're tr of what you're teaching? Is it primarily charting techniques, or are you focused more heavily on risk management and actually not blowing up your account because you yeah. think the chart is a crystal ball? Well, <laughs> I mean, I think there's four four at least four components to really if if you want to be serious about maybe being a trader as you're living or at least having having a day job and having your trading uh, produce wealth. Uh, I mean, you make money to live, but you also make money to try to build wealth. Uh, and so I think one is how you select trades. I mean, it's your, it's your method of analysis. For me, that's charting. No, you need that. You need to have something to select trades, but I think, quite frankly, it's the least component, important component. And then Same. you have risk management. How how are you going to keep your money together when you have 10 straight losing trades? Because it's going to happen probably yearly. Uh, and then, uh, so it's risk management, trade management. How do you manage trades? And then I think the third component is process. Uh, how do you treat trading as a business? Uh, and then the fourth is the most important, and that's the mental thing. That's the mental and emotional, because I think the human being is just structured in a way that they will try to sabotage their own success at every turn. Uh, trading is an upstream swim against human nature. Uh, I mean, the essence of us as human beings is inconsistent with successful market speculation. And so what does that look like to be able to, you know, if you want to know yourself, really know yourself, the good, bad, the ugly, start trading um, and be honest with yourself. I mean, trade and be honest with yourself. That's the hardest part. Nobody's honest with themselves and that's why they lose. And that's why they lose. And so you, you've, you've got to start looking at every ghost. You know, I mean, you, you got to drag out all the skeletons in your emotional closet. And then figure out, you know, how you're going to deal with that. Um, ha, ha. And, and so that's really where the payoff ends up coming. Is getting to the point you realize you're your own worst enemy when it comes to making money trading. Is you can't blame the markets. You can't blame the other person. You can't blame how you select trades. You got to blame yourself. And so uh, I, the, 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 that's really the core of market speculation. What do you think the price of Bitcoin could possibly be at the end of the year? And do you think that 100000 really is the cap, or do you think that the uh, million-dollar calls are reasonable? Well, I don't think that way, for one thing, Scott. I don't, you know, I mean, you see guys coming out here, are my favorite trades for 2021, whatever. I, you know, I, I react more than predict. You know, I want right. to react. Uh, I trade setups. I don't trade narratives. I don't trade scenarios. I trade setups. You know, right now, Bitcoin is was in a buy setup and I'm long. So I I don't know. I, I would say that uh, Bitcoin is in a parabolic advance. And should that parabolic advance continue, we sh it would project $100,000 by the first quarter of 2022. And yeah. so, uh, but hey, that parabolic, had, the parabola could be broken. And so, you know, I'll have to deal with that if and when it happens. And so uh, I don't know upside. I mean, it depends. Is, is the U.S. dollar going to cease at some point to becoming the currency, the, 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 pr the primary reserve currency of the world? And that 
uh, we, you know, we go to something else. We go to a basket that includes crude oil and Bitcoin and uh, gold and uh, all kinds of other things, special drawing rights, and that Bitcoin's part of that. So anyway, I think that's, you know, that, that's where we're at. Is bit, does it Bitcoin truly live out the most spectacular uh, narrative that people have for it? That's how. Yeah, if it does, who knows? You know, because that 21 million bitcoins are going to have to be divided in so many parcels uh, that you know, bitcoin eventually becomes a million dollars. Um, but I'll take it. You know, we take one step at a time, Scott. This has been amazing, Peter. I can't thank you enough for your time, and you just imparted an incredible amount of wisdom. Um, you taught myself and certainly others quite a few things. And more importantly for me, it gave me a whole lot of confirmation bias, <laughs> which is, which is, uh, yeah, may, may, let me know I'm on the right track. So thank you once again. This has been great. All right. Well, good enough, Scott. Good chatting with you. Thanks for watching. I'm Scott Melker. Tune in to the next show and become a trade god yourself. <laughs>